key bin and they can then upload it to the YouTube channel directly. Okay. We're now recording. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Can I just quickly try to share a screen so I know it works? Absolutely. Can you see that? It is yes. the Amherst website. Okay, it's on a different monitor. I just want to make sure that it's visible. And is it big enough that you can read something or is it? Um, well, it's about as big as you're going to be able to make it, yeah. at least with my screen. Okay, yeah. I can't I'm on a large it. screen and I can see it's taking up the entire screen. Okay, I cannot, I cannot actually see it next to our faces. So that's why I'm asking. Okay, good. That's good. Right. That's, that's one of the problems when you're sharing yeah. the screen, you lose the ability to do much else. Yeah, and, I, and how do I un unshare? Let me just. You just, uh, up above, it says, stop sharing. Hover above, hover above the screen at the top of the screen and a yeah. little red thing will come on that says stop sharing and you push that um it's not okay i've got two bars one on top of each other and i've got our show the grid video um well i can stop participant sharing which would stop it <laughs> Okay, you can cut me off when I need to. Um, but uh, I am I am not I'm also not seeing when it's when I'm sharing the screen I can't see um, the participants or if you okay here's what you do with that you go to the far right side yep. and you push. Um, I, I have to figure out what you push because I've already done it. Uh, you push you view. Not over share screen. Yeah, you should be able to. Or, or do you have participants at the bottom of your screen? We have three now. Yeah, we do. And they're listening to our <laughs> trying to get it, trying to get it right. Okay, have you figured out how to stop sharing? No. Okay, then I'm going to stop participant sharing. Okay. And then that means I probably have to. You may have to start me. I think you're okay. So now I have at the bottom, I have um, who can share, who can, who can start sharing when someone else. So. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, we have four people. Wonderful. And, and it's, it's only, two, it's two minutes of, so we still have time. So can we bring people in? The yeah, now do you wanna just bring everybody in automatically? And if they don't wanna show their screen, they don't have to, or do you want them to raise their hand if they would like to be brought into the room? Which way would you like to go? I'd like to do it automatically, if that's okay with Anika. Just okay. you know, wanna participate, it's great. Okay, then I will start bringing people in. So far, it, uh, there's John Varner. Okay, and here comes Sarah. And here comes Trudy. Hi, everybody. Hello. Uh, hello. Hello. Okay, let me try Trudy again. We have some expert help with uh, President Lynn Priestler. Yes. It's only because I've been doing it too long. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm in trouble getting, ah, oh, Ash Hartwell. Okay, we got Trudy to come in and Ash should be on his way up. There's Ash's beautiful sky. 
nice to see some uh, faces of people that we've we've seen names from but haven't seen faces. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Uh, one more coming in. <laughs> Francis. If I see a name that I'm not comfortable with, I'll ask you to. Okay, forgot to hit the mute unmute button. No problem. It's good to know you're comfortable with everyone here. Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, you all look very familiar. <laughs> and your names are familiar too. <laughs> But it is interesting over time where you see you see someone's name, you see it on an email, and and we've had so few opportunities to meet people in person. It really is this is like our only venue for for connecting to people. Mm -hmm. Right. And I actually think district meetings are some of the best places for a good conversation. Yes. Sarah Marshall is on her way in. Um, oh. I'm going to ask Diane to put her last name up if she could. Yeah. Diana. Probably Diana Stein. Might be. That's Diana Stein. Yes. <laughs> I hope. I trying to there. Here you yeah. are, Diana. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Hi, Diana. So close. And I'm getting some messages that UMass, UMass emails were down. So I'm trying to forward a link to, uh, to some more people. Oh, I've been having some trouble lately. I think it took me a while to, um, to find the original message. So maybe mm -hmm. other people would have that trouble too. It's actually on the town calendar under other community events or community events. That's it's not good. on the meeting one. Okay. And that's where you get the link that puts you in the audience and then we bring you in. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. I'm trying to bring Phyllis Whitney in and I'm, it's not working yet. <clears throat> I just checked UMass email and it's working fine. Good. Phyllis, have you updated your Zoom link lately? If not, you may need to, because I'm having trouble promoting you to a panelist. Hmm. No, I'm going to have to leave her there until we determine that. That's all we have is there's one in the audience and everybody else is in the room. And if you want to get started, you should. Lynn, if you would be so kind as you, if you see people come in, if you want to bring them in, that would be lovely. Absolutely. And, and we'll go ahead with the agenda. Thank you. So Anika and I have been collaborating on, on what, what to bring to you folks and are very excited to host our first, um, essentially our first public district meeting. Uh, so welcome, welcome to the community of District Four, Precinct Five, Precinct Nine, and I see I see names from different parts of town. So so everybody um, uh, is I see some from District Five and several from District Nine. I mean Precinct Nine. So welcome. 
Uh, Anika, do you want to go ahead and sort of introduce yourself and uh, what role you're playing, what committees you've been assigned to, and then I'll follow you and uh, we'll start from there. Sure. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Anika Lopes. Thank you so much for taking this time out of your Sunday afternoon to join us. I'm excited to be here with Pam and introduce myself and see faces, uh, most of whom I have, this is my first time seeing. Uh, so as your other counselor here for District 4, I am on uh, the committees that I'm serving on are uh, GOL, which is the Governance Organization and, and Legislation Committee. So we really serve to advise the town council on um, matters of organization and governance and making sure that things are clear, concise, and actionable, especially in regards to bylaws. I also serve on TSO, which is Town Services and Outreach. So that um, serves to advise the council on uh, matters concerning day-to-day -day, uh, provisions and services from the town and also town and community relationships. I also serve on the Jones Library Building Committee, um, which is uh, quite exciting. And uh, though we're still kind of getting things together and have a meeting scheduled together, I am uh, excited to know that I will be on the outreach committee. So um, we will have some, you know, updates to share with you all in the, you know, near future around that. And so I believe that is it for my committees at, at this time. <laughs> um, I, I neglected to sort of introduce that, that um, as most of you are pretty engaged in what's going on in town, but because this is in fact a still relatively new form of government, um, everyone's kind of getting a sense of what committees do which, what tasks are, are they responsible for. And it's a little bit like a Senate subcommittee where you have um, issues that come before the council, but need some venue to get hashed out, get worked out, get some kinks and, and discussions occurring before the council has to actually take an action on it. And so these subcommittees play a pretty vital role. Um, every year they're supposed to be renewed and, and reviewed you know, is is the responsibility sort of equitably spread across committees, um, and are the basic needs of of the council activities being represented? So that's that's um, the format of the subcommittees tracking. You know, who's doing what is tough, and we're going to try to do a little bit of um, helping understand that. Um, I'm Pam Rooney and um, I'm on Cottage Street. So I'm sort of in the, the um, precinct nine end of town. Um, and I was assigned to the community resources committee. And that is the, the committee that uh, discusses and works on planning and zoning and land use. Uh, it discusses and works on housing and homelessness. And um, also there are a couple, uh, the master plan. Also um, uh, it weighs in on economic development in town and um, let's see, and sustainability. So it's a pretty broad reach. It's really kind of the, the, the people end of the people end of things. Um, and so the other, the other, um, action on my plate is to create some kind of a task force uh, or working group. We don't know what shape or form it's going to take now, but just to talk about what are all the, the um, what are all the factors that are uh, resulting in fewer homes available for uh, working, working families, um, folks who want to live in town and work in town, and what are the factors that, that are um, um, causing a loss of homes for that segment of the population. So that's kind of us and what we do. I, I was um, really excited when we were talking about this agenda. Um, Anika is, is not giving, you know, she's not blowing her horn too much, but 
Um, we wanted to recognize that this is uh, Black History Month and that within this, within this district itself, um, Anika is a uh, shining star of what's happening uh, with an Amherst connection to Black History Month. And I wanted to um, share this, share this, Anika can share the story with you, but it's pretty darn cool that um, her roots are so deep in this community. And perhaps you can describe the award that you, uh, that you accepted just recently from the Amherst Historical Society. Okay, thank you. Uh, so yes, uh, just recently on the 12th, actually, Saturday the 12th, the Historical Society had honored actually my uh, grandfather, Dudley Bridges, who was a longtime resident of Amherst. Uh, he was a co-founder of the A Better Chance House. Uh, he was part of the group who established the uh, West Side um, area of Amherst and particularly um, Hazel Avenue, which used to um, unfortunately have a very nasty name going under the N-word lane. Uh, and, you know, so he helped establish that becoming a, a historical uh, district. He was also a trustee on the Historical Society, and that is where he started an initiative to um, daylight the Civil War tablets that we have here in Amherst, which were gifted to the town in 1893. Uh, they feature names of Black volunteer soldiers who served with the 54th Regiment, as well as the 5th Cavalry, all volunteer. Um, we actually do have two members of a Civil War tablet committee, both Carly and Gary Tartikoff with us here today. Uh, but the significance of these soldiers as it relates to Amherst is that we have here in the West Cemetery, we have soldiers who, again, were part of this 54th Regiment, along with over 300 uh, Amherst area soldiers. If you take a look at these tablets that are at the Bank Center, you'll see probably every name, every generational family, every street. It's really exciting. But these soldiers actually went to Texas um, in 1865 to deliver the news of uh, liberation and freedom, along with many other braves. And this is a day that we now celebrate as Juneteenth. Um, they are, their stories connect to present day. Uh, one of them, Christopher Thompson, that's my four times great grandfather. His brother, Charles Thompson, um, you know, he was a, a fiddler for Emily Dickinson. She writes about him in her diaries. And so you, you know, you really have these, this generational legacy of, you know, Amherst folks that are, you know, some of the first uh, families of color, they're all intertwined. They're pretty much all related. The pool was so uh, thin there, but um, what we're doing is, which is important, um, there's so much history here in Amherst uh, and it's so wonderful to daylight it, but also really to learn from it and bring it to current day. And really, where do we go from here? And with that said, uh, a side project that we're working on is also a history walk, um, which will start with uh, their legacies, but really move on to the town itself and town center. So in the upcoming weeks, we'll have some announcements of how an interested community can really become engaged. Um, this really is something that will take a village, you know, and is something that I hope will be celebrated by all residents here. It's really our one of our connectors here and you know just shows our grit. And um, it's a history that a lot of people are, are that have been here even for many years are not aware of. And also something, you know, very welcoming to people coming in new, whether it's you know new residents, new students, you know, it's really something that we can uplift and, and celebrate. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and, and I would add that that Anika accepted the Arthur F. Kinney Conch Award uh, in the name of her grandfather. So that was that was really pretty neat. So yeah. thank you. And um, I, actually, we had one more to share. I did just want to pass on that if anyone's interested, we are coming down to the end of Black History Month. 
that on a Wednesday, February 23rd at 7.30 p.m., um, the College of Humanities and Fine Arts will be celebrating a gem of, in our community who is Dr. Shirley Jackson Whitaker. Uh, she's an artist, uh, a specialist, she's um, a doctor. She has done a documentary which is called Ashes to Ashes, which actually documents it is, uh, the man was, his name was uh, Winfred Rembert, and he's the only survivor of an attempted lynching. And so this short film documents his story, their friendship, uh, we'll have a wonderful um, discussion afterwards, and I'm not sure if we can put something in the link. I know that you can go to uh, ShirleyWhitaker.com for that information, and that's also on uh, UMass at the College of Humanities and, and Fine Arts. You can uh, send, find it there, but I would recommend if anyone is not familiar with Shirley that you do check that out. And that's on the 23rd? That is the 23rd at 7.30 p.m. Great. And it's, for, it's virtual, so there'll be a Zoom link that you might want to register for as soon as possible if you're interested. Super. Thank you. Um, we wanted to just do a little rundown of sort of what, what's going on in town. Most of, uh, I see, let's see, I see a couple of um, folks in the audience that make it their business to get the word out, you know, what's going on. Uh, I see Sarah Marshall, um, and I see, uh, let's see, I thought I saw Betsy Crow, which could also be Nick Grabe, uh, just sort of keeping tabs on what's happening in the world. Um, I was going to cover a couple of, of topics, and it's uh, just to let people know uh, within the zoning arena. There's been lots of discussion lately on um, the need for a solar bylaw. So that's something that the planning department and the planning board, I see Doug Marshall there, who's the, uh, the chair of the planning board, um, that that's kind of a high priority to, to get going on a, a solar bylaw. Uh, there's also some good news that a um, uh, design guidelines uh, will, be, will be in the works. Uh, for the town center. And this is something that the planning department um, will, will hire a consultant to help uh, engage the public in what the, the look and the feel of that down, of the downtown areas and maybe the village centers um, should look like. So as, as it gets developed, there are at least some, some different guidelines on, on how um, it, uh, the buildings need to relate to the street and create kind of vibrant community that we're looking for. Um, there is uh, some parking, parking over, uh, um, parking reviews, you know, what's the status of parking in the downtown? Will there be, um, will there be a need for a parking garage? Where would that be located? Um, just getting a sense of maybe what the Boltwood garage can accommodate. So all of these things are sort of gelling and, and in the works. Um, and then there's uh, some effort to discuss uh, what rental permitting uh, is needed and maybe updating some of that. Um, Anika mentioned that she's on the library committee and perhaps there's, there's some kind of an update on that that you wanna give. Well, we are still in the process, I think as uh, many of the communities of getting off the ground, uh, we have established the the two subcommittees, which are design and then outreach. Uh, that is the one that I'm a part of. So we have not had that first meeting yet. It will be coming up uh, early March. So, you know, definitely uh, there will be some updates soon after, if not before, but we're still waiting on one other member, you know, so it would be appropriate to hold off a, a bit unless there are specific questions that I'm able to answer before that. Uh, the, just an, a quick update on the school building committee. Uh, this Tuesday, the 22nd, they're going to review what's called the educational plan. What are all the functionalities that they want to, to accommodate in a new school? Um, so what is the educational plan? And then what is the space needed to accomplish that plan, those functions? And about two weeks. So that's on the 22nd. 
um, and that's the school, the school board itself. Uh, two weeks later, the building committee um, will discuss the alternatives that are being proposed and the costs associated with those. So that's on the 4th of March. And then shortly after that, just about two weeks after that, is a um, is the target date where all of this package gets sent to um, the Massachusetts School Building Authority. They're the ones that actually borrow the money for, for the town. Um, so that's charging right along. And um, if folks are interested in that program, um, go to the, uh, I guess the, the school committee website. And I know that there are some links there for the meetings. And I'm looking at Sarah smiling and she probably, she probably knows exactly where to go for <laughs> Sarah. Can I, can I just interject something? The school project itself has a website and I believe the URL is amherst-school-project.com. So that's the owner's project manager maintains that um, for the elementary school building committee which is a separate thing from the Amherst School Committee. It's a complicated project and process, so um, there are a lot of places to look for information. Thank you very much. Excellent. So go to their website, and you can figure out how to weigh in on that as well. Um, I think we've got and yet yeah, we've got Andy. Um, and I wondered if maybe Andy, you could give an update on the Finance Committee. That's one of the the four committees standing issues that we haven't talked about yet. Is Mira. Can you put your volume up, Andy? <laughs> Andy, we're not here, yeah. good, but I'd have to choose a different microphone in your settings. Not working. Um, if folks don't, Andy, if you, if, if we, if you come in, that's great. Maybe Lynn, do you want to just step in while we're, so we don't, Spend too much time waiting. Um, sure, because I'm actually I'm on the finance committee. Um, the um, it's right now we are looking at the proposed changes in parking fees, and that's all kinds of parking fees. Uh, and there would be an increase for those fees. Actually, the town services and outreach committee will be holding a hearing on March 10th at seven o'clock. Uh, and so I please make sure that if you have things you'd like to offer before they make their recommendation back to the council, uh, you do that. We are not in the, in the heat of the uh, budget season yet. We don't really start that until um, May 1 when the town manager gives us his budget. We have, however, done our first review of the um, Community Preservation Act recommendations. Thank you, Sarah Marshall, for chairing that committee. And we have forwarded all but two, and we're not, we haven't said no to those two, but we're debating um, how we want to handle those two. They're specifically recommendations for uh, using historic money to improve uh, privately owned properties. And that's been a little it's cr created quite a bit of question. Um, but the other projects are outstanding and they're all outstanding. The committee's done a terrific job. And um, we have done, uh, previous to this council, we did a review of our uh, financial policies and we'll be working, uh, coming back to those at different points. Um, and then that's kind of where we are for the moment. I think I, I, think I now have my... Yeah, I got that solved, problem solved, and I apologize. Uh, there were several, several other things that are going on on the Community Preservation Act 
uh, there will be a public hearing about that, and it actually will be at a council meet in conjunction with the council meeting. And I believe the date we've set for that is March 28th. The uh, transportation fund March, issue. March 21. Oh, 21, okay. And it's a public forum. And uh, the uh, transportation fund um, question has to do with the uh, proposal that you may have read about in the newspaper about um, reviewing the rates that are charged for various kinds of permits, mostly having to do with um, either business or residence permits for parking and uh, in, in those areas of town where you see those signs that say that, that are limit parking during the week or during certain times to people who have permits as well as some spaces in the um, lower section of the Boltwood garage that are um, rented out as reserved spaces. And um, the um, town staff has proposed changes in those fees. Um, and uh, the finance committee is looking at the financial aspects of that and will report back to give its information then over to the TSO committee which uh, I think Anika had referenced earlier. And uh, on March 10th, there will be a public forum uh, conducted by the uh, uh, TSO committee on that particular issue. Other things that have come up are uh, we reviewed the audit. Um, there's a couple of issues that are out there um, that we've been working on for some time. Uh, one is, uh, looking at water sewer rates and how the um, how we bill for those. I'm not going to go into detail on these because they're complicated and if people have questions, I'll respond to the questions. Um, the uh, um, regional school budget uh, will come up as a separate budget issue from the rest of the town budget because of the need to have the timing for Amherst consideration coincide with when town meetings occur in the three towns that have town meetings. And there's been some uh, newspaper coverage about that particular issue also. Uh, so I think that that covers most of it because you meant there's already been mention of uh, the Community Preservation Act and um, uh, we talked about that. The other thing that I just wanted to mention because I was asked to in an email earlier is capital. Um, capital really falls into two different segments. And one is the major building projects, which we have worked on before and are going to have to review as we get new numbers in on the buildings and as we adjust to things like possible changes in interest rates. Um, there is good information available on the Amherst Engage uh, website that um, talks about how the um, plan is for structuring that. Uh, it's, it, it's again, another complex issue, but which I'll be glad to talk about at any time. And, uh, so uh, but that is going to be an ongoing finance committee matter. Um, and the other is the uh, annual decisions that are made about what capital projects will be funded in the next year. And there's a separate committee, the Joint Capital Planning Committee, that is working on it now. It will uh, report to the town manager. The town manager will then propose what's called a capital improvement program, which is uh, submitted along with the budget and will be reviewed by the finance committee and voted on by the council probably in June. Um, and uh, so, uh, but it starts with uh, the joint capital planning committee trying to develop uh, recommendations for the town manager and that's the process that's currently underway. So that's the brief, that's the summary, I think. Bam, back to you. Thank you. Uh, that's actually a nice segue into um, 
where to find information. So in all of these conversations that we're having about different committees and different activities in town, um, one of the things that struck me as I was thinking about running for office is where where do I go for information? And I know just looking at the names of folks that have weighed in here, um, many of you are actively engaged in in town events and and activities. But I but I just thought it would be worthwhile sort of refreshing our memories on on where some of this information is provided. And I wonder if uh, we've had technical things. If maybe Lynn could start my screen sharing, and I wanted to. Um, just take a look at the at the town website or where some of our information is available. You should, you should be able to pull it up. Okay. Well, let's see. How's that? Can everybody see it? Good, good. So um, when I when I'm thinking about um, either services that I need or, or um, questions that I want answered, um, I typically just go to the amherstma.gov main, main website, main page. And there's this wonderful scrolling uh, band of uh, topics. And I discovered very recently, in fact, that this button called transparency, which has lots of information that I actually wanted. I did not realize that it was in the transparency tab. So uh, exploring the transparency tab a little bit uh, was kind of a, a revelation. We have some of the budget numbers that Andy just talked about, um, but in my mind, communicating and staying in touch is kind of a really important element for people in town. It's a really good way to get information. And so uh, I think you can see since my screen is sharing, um, there's a great site under communications to notify me. And by, by going to the notify me, you can actually sign up for gazillion different opportunities for notifications that get emailed to you. And you can sign up for everything from um, notices of public meetings, you can get alerts. Can you see this at all or just you're just here? Okay. Um, bid postings and calendars. And so the calendar um, is something that I've paid a lot of attention to. If I were to go back, to, so you can you can get notified, you can get a you can get a message and email of any of these topics and it's very, very handy. Uh, a kind of fun one since um, there's been quite a bit of discussion about potholes. The service request button is a really wonderful one that um, uh, you can you can submit requests for services or for issues and complaints. Uh, there's a wonderful um, uh, map here that you can actually locate your issue, and there are. Here's one that says dead animal. Dead animal was on uh, somewhere on East Hadley Road. It looks like an opossum. You know, can somebody come haul it away? Uh, traffic or street signs have been knocked over. Um, road maintenance issue, which is probably a hot topic. Um, so you can actually place on the map your your location, write a little description, and submit it. So I thought that was just pretty cool. And uh, is a, in fact, my husband came up to me, he says, Pam, there's this huge pothole on Main Street. He says, I think it's near, it's, it's near Shumway Street. And I said, Alex, go find, go find it and we'll put it on the map. <laughs> Don't just talk to me about it, take action. And so this is a really wonderful tool for, uh, for that kind of uh, feedback to mostly to DPW. Um, and then thirdly, there's uh, meetings and agendas, which is a marvelous resource. Um, given the number of committees in town and how often they meet, it's, it's pretty mind boggling to know where to look and, and where to go. So on this, on this calendar, 
um, you can you can see listed uh, the Jones Library Board of Trustees. There's a link to the Zoom meeting um, each and every day. Uh, all of the events that are happening are listed. There's a Energy and Climate Action Committee meeting with a link. So that's just a really marvelous way to uh, to find out what's going on in town. Um, another opportunity is is the volunteering one, and that's something I think we uh, Anika and I sent out that list of all the committees that are looking for new members, and so we will put in a pitch to get engaged in. Um, in whatever committee meets your needs. You could become a committee member, you can volunteer, and a lot of that information is right here on the main, the main website. Uh, anybody wanna add anything to that? Sarah Marshall. <laughs> you just assume I'll have something <laughs> to say. I, I, I'm at, well, no. No, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, we'll put we'll put in a plug for um, for people reaching out and getting engaged. As as most of you are looking around at the names here, um, but it's just kind of a really um, nice single point of of access to all kinds of information of things that that are going on in town. And it has yeah, uh, I had mentioned earlier, and I just come back to it again. There's a separate website that the town is maintaining called, I think it's AmherstConnect.com, if I recall. Or do you Engage know, uh, Lynn? Engage Engage Amherst. Org. Dot org. And uh, it has um, some um, particular issues that have staff assigned to respond to questions and maintain an open dialogue, one of which is about the capital projects, which is what I mentioned. And um, if uh, you're interested in um, how we could possibly fund four major projects and the choices that have to be made on funding the four major projects, um, our finance director is curating that section, which is what I was referring to earlier. Um, but uh, there are other sections to it. And um, so I just wanted to point that one out too. Thank you. Yeah, actually one, one other, I'll see if I can share again. Um, one other site that is, let's see, where am I? One other site that's really, uh, I think, very handy, and that is as as community members, we will go to your government, and on your government, um, the town council has a website of its own, and if I go to that town council website, the very first thing that that shows up is click here to submit comments to the town council. So if people want to let us know anything that's going on you can you can submit comments directly this link will take take you or your comment will be will be submitted and it's accessible to all of us you can actually also see the comments that were submitted so you can get reinforcement if you want on on where things are headed um, the other important thing that i'd like to share for for us is is how to get in touch with us and there is a common uh, website. It's just called town council at amersma.gov. It's over here on the right hand side. And that is a message that is shared with every single town councilor. So that's a really handy one as well. If you don't know exactly who to target, you can target us all. Um, Ms. Griesmer has the, the pleasure of and responsibility of actually responding to the emails that come in. And she will recommend that you actually submit comments to the town council on this website instead. Um, but there's also a directory and that gives the contact information for each and every one of the counselors if you have a specific 
item that you want to discuss with somebody. So, Anika. <laughs> yeah, so with that, thank you. Thank you for that thorough walkthrough. Uh, and so with this, we want to open up to comments, questions, concerns, um, and also ask that, um, you know, this is wonderful. We have 23 of us here and we appreciate all of, you know, your time and engagement, but, you know, I'm hoping that we can work together and really spread the word. Um, we represent an important population, but a relatively small population in comparison to registered voters in the district. So I think just really important, whomever, whomever has this, you know, the networks, reach out to your neighbor, whether we agree, disagree, just so we have this open communication and dialogue and really are encouraging bringing others to the table with various perspectives and, and viewpoints. And Can with I just that, we can open the floor. Yeah, and please use the raised hand function. And mm -hmm. also that there are two people in the audience I can't seem to bring into the room. And I think it's because you may need to update your Zoom um, connectivity, but you can still raise your hand and ask questions. Okay, thank you. And I see Sarah Marshall has raised her hand. Thanks, Pam. Um, maybe this comment would be better directed at the town manager, but um, all households, or at least property owners receive mailings several times a year from the town. And it seems to me that could be an opportunity to tell people how to reach their particular um, counselors or, you know, and I know we'll all be notified in a few months about what new voting precinct and district we are in. And that's, that's one thing, but Currently, here are your town counselors, and you can follow them or get on their email lists. Yeah, great. Thank you. I think one of the things that that was, I'll just respond to that as well. One of the things that struck me is that. It is, it is really difficult to be able to reach out. And I think that's, you know, the, the back and forth that Anika mentioned is that we don't necessarily have contact information for folks. And how do you get the word out? How do you get the input if you don't have that? So, yeah. Anika, I'm sorry, I, I stepped in there. Well, we're in this together. Like, you know, we're raising hands, but everyone should speak freely. So John Varner has his hand up. Uh, well, I have several questions, but the, the first one is regarding the parking garage uh, assessment. I was part of town meeting when we went through the whole Boltwood garage process. And uh, I understood then that what we authorized and what was constructed was done in a way to allow for an additional story of parking to be built on top of the lot that is there now. And I'm wondering, is that not the case? Has that been abandoned? And um, I just need clarity on that issue. Um, work I'll, on that one, Pam. I'll respond to that. And, that. and in fact, it was designed for a second story. Um, what has not been clear to people is if there have been changes in the code since that time, and if there are now, um, conflicts with with the proximity of buildings around the Boltwood garage itself. So as I understand it, there has been money um, allocated to a consultant who can actually do the, the structural engineering review that's needed. It will answer that question forever because it keeps cycling around and we would love to have that um, uh, put to bed or put to use one or the other. Ash Hartwell has his hand up. And he needs to unmute. Ash, you need to unmute. The most commonly said under Zoom is please unmute. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, 
Pam, I was interested that um, you, you mentioned that you uh, may be uh, <laughs> working to create a task force on the shortage of housing um, for the work, you know, for people who, who work in the town but can't afford to live here. Uh, this has been a perennial problem from Amherst's for forever. <laughs> and um, it has a lot to do with the fact that uh, uh, some estimate, and it's hard to know what that estimate actually is, of university students are in residence. And um, their, the whole pattern of their uh, occupation um, distorts actually the permanent residents uh, uh, and, and those who would like to live here because of high rents that um, are because four students will live in a room. I, I'm exaggerating. But uh, the, the point is that the whole relationship between the universities and the town is a major influence on our demographics and our, uh, our, our equity and the rest of it. And um, I, I don't know that this really has been tackled uh, in a systematic way, but it's evident that we are not alone as towns that are um, affected by a large university presence that distorts the whole economy, as it were. Um, uh, and there, there are two things that are underway, perhaps. One of them is the, uh, the, the, the Black Census that is proposed by the uh, Amherst, uh, um, sorry, the um, African Heritage Reparation Assembly, um, I think is, is working to establish a Black um, uh, that, that will be helpful, but it would be partial. And I wonder if, um, how it is does the council or others um, undertake to do some research around some of these fundamental structural issues that really affect the BIPOC and the poor population in, um, that is a part of us. So Big question. I, I don't expect a detailed answer, but I just put it on the table. Thank you. I can reply with the, the intent of, of a deeper dive. And I think what we, there are lots of, there are lots of studies that have looked at one issue or another. And I think holistically, we've not necessarily taken taken all those pieces and put them together. What are the factors? What are the factors that we can manage as a town? And, and what, are, what are lessons learned from other college towns? How do we, how do we house students, but how do we also house uh, the population that we want to have in town to support the school systems and to be engaged citizens? Um, we have everything from tax rates to real estate practices, you know, what, what are those portions that we can actually um, focus on and make some, um, make some gains to, I guess it's, you know, I'm gonna put this in context. There is housing that is being built across the nation actually, that is very high end. It is, it is the most profitable for someone who's willing to put money at risk and build housing. There is also the other end of the spectrum where there are grants and opportunities for state support to build affordable housing. Nobody is, nobody is tackling the, the range in between, which is a pretty big range. Um, if, if in fact our only assets in town are our current housing stock, then how do we manage to hold on to enough of that existing housing stock and make it available for families, that's, that's part of what I would like to get accomplished. And just, just understand what those factors are and, and what of those can we manage. I would also just like to chime in if I can, this is a, another push towards outreach, whereas you know, AHRA will do what they can uh, you know, we really need to be uh, creative to, to get out there and just expand our, our voices. We seem to, you know, sometimes have pods where we maybe have four and five people speaking for, you know, BIPOC community or just a few counselors. And there, you know, that is not only untrue, but it's also, I think, dangerous also with any population. 
um, and just really um, expanding what the the low income population is and also realistic that that does include students. We have homeless students as well. Um, you know, so we have trouble, you know, across the board and, you know, there's not that, you know, fixed solution answer, but, you know, just, just really all of us doing what we can to work together to figure it out and especially, you know, reaching broader populations so you know, we have more people speaking for themselves. If I could just say that part of this has to do with the relationship between the town and the universities and the issue of equity. Um, and just to put that on the, <laughs> that, that we get relatively a pittance from the university in terms of the, um, the presence of the university in the town and its effect, so. And just last, I'm sorry, I don't wanna take up too much of the, your time to, for everyone to respond and ask questions, but we have also spoke with both um, uh, Tony Marulis and Nancy, Nancy Buffon who work with the Chancellor at UMass and they're happy with our, you know, at an ongoing, an, an upcoming meeting rather to also join us to be able to answer questions and hear from residents in person or on Zoom, wherever we are at that time. Mm -hmm. Lynn, Lynn Griesmer is, but I think she's going to say Pam Corza. Pam Corza has her hand up. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I am here. I live on Jeffrey Lane. I am a neighbor of John Varner's and Francis Caparello, who's also on this call. Uh, and here because of the reason of uh, the rental issues around student housing, um, we on Jeffrey Lane recently, as many of you probably know, uh, have uh, had two houses turn over to student rentals uh, owned by the same person. And <clears throat> my question I think has, has more or less been answered. Uh, it was uh, around the, the uh, rental permitting that you mentioned, Pam, um, and what kinds of considerations you have in the hopper uh, to date, or if, you're, or if those are evolving, how we can as residents be abreast of what's being considered, have input at timely moments um, so that, that those of us in the whole of Amherst can really be talking about this issue. And I will also um, remind that John uh, Varner has written two um, what I think are stellar pieces uh, in the Amherst Bulletin that uh, outline actual recommendations. The first one, I forget when you wrote it, John, but uh, several months ago. Uh, so um, just want to put my voice in the mix because it is a concern and uh, it's a property value concern for those of us who are uh, abutting derelict properties. And um, so anyway, I, I, I'll let John go next because I think his hand was up after mine, but he may have more detail. Yeah. yeah, if I can, if I could jump in, um, I think that there are a lot of possible solutions and I don't see any one massive solution being developed to address everything. I think there's a lot of, a lot of interlocking issues and what Amherst is dealing with is also being uh, dealt with as a problem in a lot of communities around the country. I would direct people to a, uh, an article in the Washington Post yesterday about the high percentage of properties in the Atlanta area that are being bought by investors to turn over into investment properties where they're gonna make a bunch of money. Uh, it's, it's predominantly in the lower income sections of Atlanta that this is happening. Uh, and basically the same thing is happening here in Amherst. Uh, you know, I know that landlords um, wanna make as much as they can off their investments, uh, but at the same time, their investments um, if they directly impact the welfare and uh, value of other people's property, um, you know, it's, it's unfair. Uh, it's, and there are a lot of strategies that Amherst could adopt to help curtail uh, investment uh, for the person or for the purpose of uh, converting single family units into uh, student housing. And one of the ones that I'm most keen about pursuing is the idea of uh, establishing zoning districts in which 
the distance between student houses is specified. Uh, State College Pennsylvania has done this extensively. I was in touch with their, um, their zoning manager in State College and they have three separate zoning districts. Um, the details uh, I don't need to go into here, but what it basically does is for most of the people in that community, establish a buffer zone around individual single family homes and prevents landlords from coming in and buying up entire neighborhoods. Here on Jeffrey Lane, we have two properties within a few hundred feet of each other that have been converted into student houses. This year, we're lucky the students have been fairly well behaved. The landlord has been fairly responsive in dealing with some of the issues around property maintenance that we've brought up. But um, as another uh, friend of mine who lived on McClellan and ended up moving out because uh, McClellan just turned into a student ghetto, um, said it's okay up to a point and then all of a sudden it's not okay. And in my mind, if another house or two on Jeffrey Lane converted into student housing, we will be a student ghetto and everybody's property values will decline, our qualities of life will decline. And Amherst is providing a lot of opportunities for landlords to make money. They need to step up and provide protection for individual homeowners several hundred units of single family housing have been converted to student housing recently in Amherst over the last decade or a little more than that. And um, there are ways to limit this. Uh, again, it's kind of interlocking with an issue all over the country where uh, America is becoming a, a place of landed gentry where a few people own scads of properties as investments and everybody else pays them their due uh, instead of putting money into owning property as an investment, uh, which is kind of the American dream. Um, so I'm just curious to know how to direct town council to address these more, uh, more directly and uh, what the best way to put pressure on town management, which I think has been sort of derelict in its duty. Uh, the town manager, I think is, uh, he's listening to landlords who have a lot of money and uh, Real estate is the business of Amherst. That is, that is about all we've got going for us at this point. And I think um, unless we're very aggressive in limiting uh, the conversion of single family homes into student housing, we are going to become a student ghetto. It's gonna reduce the quality of life in the whole town. And the things that have made town a, an attractive destination for people uh, to live, the engaged populace, the school system, uh, these things are going to deteriorate if there is much more erosion in single family housing in town. And at that point, it will even impact people who live in wealthier um, districts in town, which are not now problems for uh, student housing conversions, uh, places like Amherst Woods or um, a few other neighborhoods in town uh, that are more well to do and, and sort of protected by their um, their value from investors coming in, buying up properties and turning it over into a cash cow for student rental housing. Uh, but uh, how can we as citizens uh, introduce measures, uh, ride herd on what's being talked about? You know, I've, I've brought this up now to a couple of different people, but I really don't know what steps town council is taking to address the issue. Uh, and I don't know how to bring more pressure to bear on uh, town management. And uh, it's just, it's very frustrating for me to be in a position that I feel like, uh, you know, I'm, I feel like going out there in the middle of Amherst and, and giving that nut with the, with the MAGA signs in the middle of town, a little competition and just holding up signs about, oh, you know, limit student housing, oh, you know, like limit investments that are displacing individual families. It's like, you know, that's the level of frustration that I'm at right now. And, and I'm, I'm just interested in knowing what I can do. Let's hear from a couple other folks and, and, and we can respond to that in a second. But I'd love to hear from, from the Vernon Joneses. Is it appropriate for me to comment on a different issue at this point? Sure. We'll come, we can come okay. back. All right. Uh, first of all, hi, everybody. And thank you for having this meeting. And thank you to all of you who are serving as our town counselors. Uh, I'm well aware that it is a huge job and the 
the number of issues you face is uh, incredible. Um, it'll come as no surprise to you that I'm particularly interested in um, how things are going to move forward on both the Community Safety Working Group report uh, and on the uh, Climate Action Plan. Uh, I think in a number of places, it's not clear where responsibility lies with the town council and where it lies with the town manager. Uh, and even where it does lie with the town manager, I think we rely on the town council uh, to keep a, a focus uh, on these issues and to uh, see that they keep moving forward. Um, I don't know what's realistic. I, I would love to see a monthly report to the town council uh, on both of those issues, uh, because both of them, we have some momentum, we have some excellent recommendations, um, but I don't think the action on them is moving forward at the pace that, that it could. Um, and let me just comment, uh, go back to John, I have some sympathy with the issue you're raising, but I would like to ask that we try to find a word other than the word ghetto. Uh, to be used in discussing these issues. I think it's a word with all sorts of associations, some of which are very negative uh, and tap into both issues of race and anti-Semitism. Um, and I think John's pointing to a real problem, but I think a different word would probably give us uh, more productive conversations. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. I wanted to, uh also chime with that I to take a minute where as I do for John Werner, I, I understand everything that you were saying, but just even the very definition of uh, ghetto, I think that we need to work with that because it's certainly not going to lead us to uh, creating a more diverse community. And I don't think that that's what you meant, but you know, in terms of attracting single families, um, and professionals may want to come here and establish business, I think that we should collectively find another word because I, I have heard that uh, more times than I could count and it's stemming each and every time. What word would you suggest? Well, someone talked about a, a dilapidated area, some of them are. I've walked around myself and as uh, someone who has, you know, I haven't been here for quite some time, but I do remember as a kid and walking around some of the areas, especially about in UMass. And I think it's clear that we all see, um, that we can see the difference, especially those of us that are here now and haven't been here. Uh, we can figure that out. Um, one that is not offensive or, you know, has a, racist tones to it. I don't know if this meeting will be the day, but I'm happy to follow up with a list of words um, by the end of day that I think could be more appropriate and then we can adopt what people are comfortable with. Counselor Andy Steinberg. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna get into the suggestion of the final name, but I think that we recognize that the question is that there are neighborhoods where there has been a high concentration of um, student rentals and that it, um, when you get to neighborhoods that have um, particularly high rates of uh, residences in proportion, that it does change the neighborhood. and. I think that um, the concept is what we need to concentrate on um, by trying to give it a single name. Um, it does get into problems. It sort of is equivalent to what I've uh, um, sort of felt uncomfortable with uh, when people talk about some of the new apartment uh, mixed residence buildings in downtown and refer to them as student as dorms. They're not dorms, they're apartment buildings that are heavily concentrated with uh, a high proportion of student rentals, but they are not dormitories. And uh, I think that it's, it, it creates a uh, um, tension within the community um, because the students are a part of our community. It's the nature of university town. And uh, just 
two quick things and then I want to turn it back over to um, the district councilors is that uh, I think that there are two things that are being work, looked at very closely by a number of counselors. One is the rental registration bylaw, which was passed originally by town meeting some time ago and just needs to be updated. And there are a lot of aspects of the student uh, of the rental registration bylaw that have over time um, proven to be inadequate, including to, to many minds, the uh, amount that is being charged just to be able to um, register property um, as well as enforcement. If we had more money coming into that system, then we would be able to hire more inspectors. And that would, uh, so that's something that a group I know is looking at. And um, if uh, uh, the other is, uh, what was mentioned previously by John, and that is uh, uh, the zoning. And I know of counselors who are working on the zoning issue. Um, and um, I'm um, confident that um, there are counselors who are there. And what I would just encourage is to use those communications methods that Pam talked about earlier and um, just keep um, keep after the issues because uh, I, I counselors are listening. So thank you. Lynn. Yeah, I, I just wanted to address a couple of questions that Russ Vernon Jones asked. And that is that it has, we have an understanding with the town manager that he will regularly report in his town manager's report on both the progress on the um, ECAC recommendations, as well as the progress on the CSWG recommendations. Um, my, I believe he has communicated to me that he will be doing um, the uh, progress on the CSWG recommendations at this next meeting. He'll, it'll be in his town manager report and um, that he, then we also have an opportunity to raise questions about that. And the manager's report is part of the packet that's available to the public as is anything else. ECAC has just um, presented their annual report to us. It is in our packet for the 28th as well. And we're looking for a date when they may actually come and do a little update with us as well. Okay. Thank you. I wanted to, to reply um, to the conversation as well. And in terms of um, the task force, the working group, whatever moniker it gets, um, I think try, is trying to look at it a little bit holistically. So the, the rental permitting is one aspect of it. And as I said before, perhaps there's a review of the taxation, you know, the tax rate, because we have income properties versus owner occupied non-income mine is certainly not an income generating uh, um, property here. Um, so the, I, I would like to see the, the different aspects knitted together rather than tackling these separate pieces one by one. They just, they really do need to, to fit together and, and be kind of a man, help us manage in a more comprehensive way how we deal with this. I see um, Sarah Marshall's hand up. Uh, yeah, no, I, I just wanted to say, um, Lynn mentioned the town manager reports. I believe you that we can subscribe to receive those directly, the town manager's reports. So you don't have to know where to look for town council packets and then find it within the packet. I think you can just get them yourself. Oh, and Doug also has something to say. <laughs> Yeah, in, 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 in uh, response to people who want to raise the issue of housing uh, in town, uh, I just wanted to say as a member of the planning board, uh, in addition to giving uh, communication to town council, you, can, you are welcome to come to planning board meetings and make public comments. Um, we do listen and, uh, you know, uh, we, we're thinking a lot about housing too. And uh, 
more public voices is good. I think John Varner and then and then the Vernon Joneses. Uh, I'd like to make one more comment and then I have to actually jump off. I have uh, some people waiting for me here, but um, I think whatever we do in terms of establishing regulations uh, needs to be backed up with enough funding for reinforcement. I was speaking with John Thompson, the uh, guy with the uh, hapless job of trying to ride herd on student housing, and he has over 5,000 rental units in town that he is supposed to be managing or riding herd on, and uh, it's, a, it's a hopeless task. I mean, he just, there's not enough, you know, if he was working 24 hours a day, there still would not be enough uh, time to uh, for him to address all the problems that are coming up. And so these problems just get rolled over and people are, uh, you know, landlords are being cited for violations and then there's no follow-up on collecting the fees that are stipulated as the penalties for violations. Um, you know, I think that Amherst has to do more than get rules on the books. They also have to uh, get mechanisms and funding in place to enforce those rules. Uh, my my comment. And uh, again, I apologize. I, I do need to uh, sign off here in a, just a couple of minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Lydia. Thank you. Uh, yes. Hi. Um, I just want to jump all the way back to Sarah Marshall's I issue about getting um, increasing the number of people on this meet at these meetings. Um, I'm wondering whether our former town count district town councilors would be gracious enough to use their email lists and send out to the people that they were representing uh, how to get involved now, uh, because they had a much more extensive list, I think. And uh, maybe, you know, if we can't get the town to do it, maybe they could do that. That's all. Thank you. I asked, I asked, and I haven't received it yet, so. I had some luck of asking, you know, others to send our information to their list um, because I think you do have sort of people there could be conflicts in them handing over their list. But, you know, we have had so we had um, the Amherst Current and then I believe in it as well had at least sent uh, the, the agendas for this meeting out and um, we'll keep pushing. And we appreciated very much having the current and the indie send, you know, post that. It was great. Um, and we got a number of responses that way. So thank you. Diana. You have to need to unmute. Diana, you need to unmute. I muted because of the phone. I um, think it would be really helpful if you would send out the day before the meeting a reminder with the link. I think people uh, have trouble getting on sometimes because the message was so long ago uh, mm -hmm. that it had the um, link. And I, for meetings that do that, I find it very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. But thank you for this meeting. Thank you for joining. Any other hands? Um, I see folks that haven't said much, but you're welcome to. Oh, Mr. Ash Hartwell. And you need to first I want to unmute. <laughs> Thank you. And then I, I, I want to echo. I I I was remiss and really not um acknowledging and, and honoring your um your your work on the town council we know that it is an enormous task and uh and we're just so grateful for people who are willing to step up and really work at improving the conditions of the town and and looking at the issues of equity and all the rest that is on your plate so just a a, a note of tribute <laughs> and thanks and thanks for everyone who's here Thanks for saying that. I actually, I actually had hoped that Steve Schreiber and Evan Ross might come to this meeting where we could actually thank them for three years of hard work getting the ball rolling. So um, they didn't show up. So we 
but we can still thank them. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I, I don't see any of their hands, but I, I um, would love to encourage people to, uh, if you get a notice from us that we're gonna hold another meeting, um, send it to friends, send it to neighbors, and also write to us and suggest opportunities to meet with people because we can meet in person, you know, outside as the weather gets a little warmer um, or even meet with um, select groups if you wanna put something together for the senior citizens or the Clark House or something like that, we would be very happy to meet with folks. Anika, do you want to add anything? And then maybe we just we can we can say thanks for everyone's time. This was terrific. I think that you covered that with that uh, recap right there. Thank you all for having us for voting us in. And please, you know, along with ongoing issues that are going with council, even if there are other agendas or concerns that may, you know, not be on the agenda that are important to you, you know, please send those along as well. Yes, I would build on that. We would love to have uh, topics of interest to you that we can do some homework and bring back information for you on a number of things. So let us know. Thank you all. Thank you. This has been great seeing a few faces and seeing names. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate it very much. Thanks for uh, letting including us. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's a little. It was reassuring to have some some seasoned voices. You guys did great. You didn't need us. You didn't need, oh yeah, yeah, we did. I see Sarah Stelfner. Hi. Didn't hear from you, but glad you were here. <laughs>